Hello, everybody, and welcome to our briefing a decade after Stuxnet, how Siemens S7 is still an attacker's heaven. A little bit about us. So my name is Colin. Hi. And I'm, I've been reverse engineering industrial control systems for the past five years at my daily job at Enlice. Prior to that, I have been reverse engineering Windows internals for an even longer time for the ReactOS project for over a decade now. And apart from that, I consider myself a Rust enthusiast. I'm really happy that I can develop all our connectors for industrial control systems in Rust at my daily job. And in my spare time, I also develop a few crates to bring the Windows and Rust ecosystems closer together. Hey everyone, I'm Tom. Um, I mostly consider myself to be a hacker and software developer, so my day job is just reverse engineering and also uh, developing code. But uh, by night, I also like doing vulnerability research. I'm mostly interested in low-level systems, so CPUs, kernels, firmware, reverse engineering, all that kind of stuff. Um, but apart part of, of that, uh, I'm also a member of the Fluxfinger CTF team and uh, do a lot of cool challenges with them. So before we start, a little introduction to PLCs, um, or programmable logic controllers, as they are called. So the Siemens S7 is a so-called programmable logic controller. And I take it that most people in this room probably have a computer science background. So from a computer science perspective, you can imagine a PLC like an embedded computer. They, are, they come in DIN rail mountable cases. They have longer availability, but it's mostly that. All current PLCs also feature Ethernet ports, and this makes it very compelling to just plug them into a company network, which is where all security nightmares begin. Many PLCs feature ARM CPUs. Some even come with x86. Many vendors also don't want to tell you what CPU is inside, but this usually doesn't really matter because um, you're not supposed to program them down to the instruction level anyway. PLCs are all around us, even though they usually remain invisible to the user. So um, with their roles in power plants, grids, pipelines, water utilities, so all kinds of critical infrastructure, you can consider them the backbone of modern life. And if we think about the manufacturing and processing industry, you can imagine every product that you hold in your hand has also gone through multiple PLCs during its production. Uh, finally, PLCs also serve an important role in building automation, so I would be surprised if this building here was not powered by PLCs. So to put it in a nutshell, if our PLCs are hacked, we have really serious physical problems, and this is why this is so important. The global PLC market is dominated by five companies that account for over 80% of the market. The Siemens is clearly leading that market with a share of 31%. During our daily job, we had a look at most of these vendors, and it should be noted, uh, nobody takes security as uh, important as Siemens does, but this comes with a caveat. I'm talking here about both proven security through applied cryptography, as well as security by obscurity through the layers which we are going to uncover today. I mean, the first part is clearly understandable, as Siemens was the main victim of Stuxnet back in 2010, but I'm really surprised that they managed to get away with security by obscurity for so long. Finally, as we in the IT world like to have our two-letter abbreviations, it should also be said the industrial automation people also have their two-letter abbreviation. They often talk about the OT world. OT, in this case, means operational technology. Programming PLCs is what mostly differentiates them from other embedded computers. So um, the IEC standardizes uh, for programming languages for PLCs. They are vendor agnostic, and two of them are even graphical. So what you see here in the example is such a graphical uh, programming language. And Actually, the standard is, does a pretty good job at unifying education on PLC programming and defining some concepts that apply for all PLCs. 
across all vendors. So one of these concepts is global variables, and this is what actually made PLCs interesting for me in the first place, because I was tasked to read data from a welding machine, live process data, such data comes in global variables, and due to that concept, I just knew I had to read out these global variables. But here comes the problem. Communication with PLCs is not standardized by the IEC. And this is, again, something where every PLC vendor has their proprietary protocol and even likes to use, make use of their vendor lock-in. It's a classic scenario here. If you buy the PLC from one vendor, you are also supposed to buy the HMI and other components from the same vendor. I have to admit there are a few protocols for interoperability, but so far none of them are first-class citizens. So my first S7-1500 PLC was in a welding machine, and this welding machine actually had no other means to communicate with it other than the S7 proprietary protocol. So what I did was opening Wireshark. There is a nice disk sector for the S7 uh, these days. And what I could see was, OK, it's mostly a plain text protocol. I could read everything on the wire. It was not encrypted. But the handshake had some cryptography bits inside. So there was an integrity Mac. And there was also something I haven't seen before, which is called the um, security key encrypted key. This is important to get right during the handshake, and this was very proprietary cryptography that I have seen no, nowhere else. But uh, anyway, that was mostly it. Everything else was plain text readable. Nevertheless, despite all these proprietary cryptography bits, which definitely took some time for Siemens, why have I been able to connect to nearly every S7 without entering any credentials, like a password. I mean, even my Windows computer at home asks for a password when I log in. Why isn't that standard for PLCs? And that was back in July 2019. And with that knowledge, I thought, OK, it must be, uh, there must be a single master key. How hard can it actually be to write my own client for a Siemens S7 PLC? And six weeks later, as a single-person project, I actually had my first proof-of-concept client to connect to the S7-1500. I have to admit, back then, many things were hard-coded, many things were not fully understood, but this client worked. It worked for the welding machine, and it also worked for other S7 machines that we have seen back then. With that client, I could already read variables, which is what I originally wanted. But the protocol also allowed me to write variables or outright stop the entire machine. Now let's fast forward to 2023. Uh, back in the same year of 2019, a few more publications have been released, which confirm our findings from the same year. So basically, the S7 communication protocol has a single master key. And if you figure out that public key, you can write your own client. There has also been a very important publication last year where the team 82 at Clarity was able to uncover the hidden private key of an S7 and thereby even break the last defenses of Siemens PLCs. What all these publications have in common, they tell us what's possible. They don't tell us exactly how it's possible. Crucial det details to reproduce the findings are left out. And probably the researchers had good reasons for that back then. But the consequence is also that researchers like us need to do the same work over and over again. And this is what we are going to change today. For that, we had a look at the Siemens S7-1500 software controller. This is a software-only variant of the popular S7-1500 PLC. It nicely runs in a VM on a reg regular x86 computer next to Windows. And all these properties make it very accessible to the research community. 
The protocol, the communication protocol that is spoken by this software controller has been introduced in 2015 with Clarity's um, publication last year in 2022. It has been superseded by a standards-based TLS protocol. However, that firmware update has hardly seen existing machines. So the communication protocol from 2015 is still the most popular one. The concepts of that protocol are also similar to the hardware PLC, but the actual cryptographic details are different. So what you see today about the software controller can't exactly be applied to the hardware one. Anyway, concepts are similar. So what we did, we started reverse engineering the software controller. And when you actually do that, um, you find a self-contained ELF binary of the entire software controller firmware. But sadly, you soon find out it is encrypted. It can't just be put into Ghidra. Fortunately, Bitan and Dankner have last year developed a harness for the Intel PIN framework to use the decryptor code, which is also standalone and comes in another binary, and to jump right into the decryption function, call it to decrypt the binary, and then receive a decrypted ELF binary. To our regret, that harness was not released to the general public, so we had to redo their work. And this is what we've done, and we are releasing our work today. We have re-implemented the harness. You find it on GitHub here. Check it out if you like. And if you're interested in more details about this method, check out the excellent talk that they gave at Black Hat USA last year. I don't want to go into any more details here. They have already laid it out. If you are interested in just using the method, you have our code on GitHub now. So now that we have a regular ELF binary for dynamic analysis, Tom will take over and show you what we found there. OK, so now that we had the firmware decrypted, our first idea was to actually run it in the VM and then attach the debugger and figure out what it's doing during the handshake so that we can replicate it. And so of course, the first step to that is that usually firmware files have some kind of header that basically tells the computer where to load it in into memory and where to jump to start executing code. And so there was also a header, the so-called multi-boot header present in that file. Um, but even though that header existed, it turned out that it was at the wrong location and there were a couple other things that didn't really work out. Um, so instead of just using the normal bootloaders, um, we just implemented our own that then just uh, takes the image, uh, loads it up, and uh, starts executing. And so that worked pretty well. Um, initially, during, uh, during initial uh, yeah, analysis, static analysis, and we saw a lot of logging calls, and so we initially expected to see some of those after we booted the firmware. Um, but it turns out that we didn't see anything, and there's a simple reason for that, um, which was that even though there are logging calls, they are uh, disabled at compile time. And so the function that actually is supposed to print out the messages uh, just does nothing. And so that's where we also took advantage of a bootloader. Uh, so instead of just loading the binary, we also modify it in place. Um, so, for example, uh, you see some code here that just uh, patches the puts function so that it actually prints out the messages to a serial port. And we just uh, do that before jumping to the entry point. And so now, once we've done that, and we can actually see all those messages. And so at the beginning, you can see the PLC trying to query some information about itself so that it knows which con configuration it's supposed to be running. And that continues on all the way through um, to the uh, end of the early boot process. Um, where it states that the process is completed and starts um, executing user thread. Unfortunately, that is where those logging calls end, but it still was very useful to get those stages up and working. Um, so the next problem was that uh, the firmware is, of course, supposed to be running in a virtual machine, and virtual machines often communicate with the hypervisor through so-called hyper calls. Uh, those usually serve two purposes. Um, the first one is that some things are just really difficult to do. So for example, the VM can't really know information about its own memory, so it uh, talks to the hypervisor to do that. Um, another thing is that just sometimes doing things through the hypervisor is just more efficient, and that's probably why they decided to uh, also access IO APIC registers through the hypervisor. Um, in the end, it turned out that we are not using Siemens hypervisor, and of course, we were using uh, the Linux hypervisor, KVM, and that hypervisor expects different hypercalls. 
In the end, what this results in is that the firmware is trying to communi communicate with the hypervisor, but the hypervisor doesn't know what to do with that information because it expects different hypercalls. They are just certain set of sets of conventions that are just different. Um, so in the end, what we decided to do was stop using hardware virtualization and to stop relying on the hypervisor. And instead, we just use software virtualization, where we can then just go ahead and change the way the VMM call instruction is emulated. And by doing that, we can then just go ahead and implement the hypercalls like we want to. Uh, so the next thing that we want notice that is that uh, in order to, um, for the firmware to boot, it expects certain PCI devices to be there. Um, so the first two that we noticed were called WSync and COMTRC. Uh, to this day, we're still not really sure what they're supposed to be doing, um, but we know that the firmware w won't boot without them. Um, so we tried to emulate them in such a way that the uh, firmware eventually makes progress, um, but in the end, we couldn't really uh, figure out what they're supposed to be doing, and this was eventually a dead end. Um, so if you want to continue working on that, um, all of the code that we used for that, so uh, as well as like the bootloader, as well as the modifications to QM QMU for the hypercalls, are both available on GitHub, and um, yeah. So um, know that uh, running the firmware isn't a viable option. Uh, the next best thing is then static analysis, and where you just look at the binary without actually running it. And the first big problem with that is that the firmware is actually a really weird binary. So the uh, firmware is a 32-bit ELF file, um, but it actually runs 64-bit code. Uh, but even though it's using 64-bit code, all the pointers are only 32 bits. I'm not sure why they decided to do that, but yeah, that's just what we have to deal with. Um, so the problem with that is that a lot of the compilers like Ida, Binja, Gitra, they, they really don't like that. They all don't have the same problems, but in the end, none of them really work straight out of the box. And so, for example, um, Gitra, as you can see here, it tries to do a lot of casts that just make reverse engineering just not, like, that's not great. Like, really difficult. Um, so, yeah. Uh, to get around that, um, we decided to just um, fork Gitra and in particular the processor definitions and just switch them up a bit. So um, we used the regular 64-bit instruction set, but just changed all of the pointers and addresses to be 32-bit. And once we've done that, we actually get really, really nice decompilation results. And um, this also applies for certain structures. So um, for example, L files have headers in them and Pointers have certain sizes, and this also fixes the start. And uh, yeah, once we've done that, all the decompilation results are really useful. Um, so if you also want to use that, um, that code is also available on uh, GitHub. You can just uh, download it and install it in, as a plugin into Ghidra. And once you've done that, you get all those nice features. Um, so the next thing that we uh, noticed that, that the firmware contains a lot of RTTI information, uh, which is called runtime type information, and which just provides a lot of context about C++ classes. And uh, there's a really great, uh, great plugin by Andrew Stelsky, which just required one small fix and also depended on those pointer sizes uh, from earlier. Um, but that fi fix has since been upstreamed and uh, we were able to identify about 8,000 C++ classes. Last but not least, um, we also wrote a couple of scripts. Um, so for example, there's a certain function that gets called by a lot of functions um, that contains that function's name. Um, so we just wrote some scripts to recover function names from that. And also the communication protocol, which is of course the thing we are interested in, uh, in the, the thing that we're really interested in, um, contains a lot of error codes that are really easily uh, recognizable. And so we wrote a script to also um, yeah, decode those errors and annotate them with comments. And so all of those scripts are also part of the plugin. So if you download that and install it into Gitra, you get access to all of those. Yeah. So. Now that we talked about how we did the analysis, uh, let's actually talk about the results of it. Um, and of course, the thing we're interested in were how the handshake works, how all the crypto, crypto works. Um, so let's start with a very high level overview of the handshake. Um, so first off, you have the official client, which is called here portal, um, that sends a message to the S7 PLC and that it wants to create a session. Um, the PLC then responds with a challenge, um, which the client will then encrypt. Um, as long, uh, along with a symmetric key, um, send that back to the PLC, which will decrypt the challenge and symmetric key. And then after that's done, both parties activate integrity protection. So even though the um, protocol is not encrypted, you also can't for force messages because there is uh, integrity protection. Um, yeah. So it turns out that the part about um, the challenge and the symmetric key is specific to hardware variants and software variants. 
Um, so not a lot is known about the hardware variants. It's known to be very heavy, heavily obfuscated. Some parts have been identified as like elliptic curve, 160-bit, El Gamal, something like that. Um, but unfortunately, no full description has ever been published. Um, what we'll present today is a full description of the, um, the algorithms required for the software variant. Um, so um, you can also uh, see a lot more details in our white paper. And if you follow all of those, we will be able to create a session to the PLC. And um, one last thing, the challenge mo mainly serves two purposes. Um, so the first one is to prevent replay attacks. So you can't just capture some packets and then replay them to the PLC. The challenge will prevent that. Um, but another thing that's also very noteworthy is that the challenge seemingly uh, exists to just make connecting to your PLC harder. It seems that Siemens really doesn't want other people to connect to PLCs other than with the official clients. And so we'll see a lot of obfuscation that has gone into uh, those encryption algorithms that seemingly don't serve any purpose other than obfuscation. Okay, um, so let's start with the broad overview of the handshake. It mostly has three steps. Um, the first one is to derive a shared secret using, asymmetric, uh, using an asymmetric key exchange. We will then derive some keys from that. And lastly, we'll use those keys to actually transmit the challenge in symmetric key. So the asymmetric key exchange uh, is done over elliptic curve diffie Hellman using a custom curve. So usually with elliptic curve cryptography, you have certain curves that are published by um, organiza organizations like NIST. Instead of that, Siemens seemingly has decided to go with a completely custom curve. And so, yeah, um, that's the first thing we had to reverse engineer. Um, we already talked about that there's a single master key. Well, it turns out that that's a private key on the PLC side. So correspondingly to that, you also have a single public key. And that's what you can see here. Um, how can we be so sure that those are really the parameters? Well, it turns out that we found some code that exactly uses the equation for an elliptic curve to check whether, uh, in this case, the public key is on the curve. So by just looking at the equation, we can then just figure out all of the parameters used for the um, elliptic curve, which is really useful for us. Um, one quick reminder about how elliptic curve the Hellman works. Um, so each party generates a nonce. That will be its private key. It then uses that nonce and multiplies uh, um, a base point G with it. That is then the public key. Um, so when, also when I say multiplication, it's like not regular integer multiplication, but elliptic curve multiplication. So it's a, it's a bit more convoluted, but it's manageable. And yeah, so that's the public key. Um, each, party, each party does that. Um, and lastly, um, to get the shared secret, we then multiply the other party's public key with the nonce again. And uh, in the end, uh, the math works out so that both parties get the same shared secret, but none of uh, an outsider wouldn't be able to uh, also get that secret by just looking at the uh, um, public keys ex exchanged. Um, so we can also see some code doing exactly that, just gener generating a random number, um, using elliptic curve math to multiply it by the base point, and then multiplying the other, other party's uh, public key to get the shared, uh, shared secret. Um, so now that we have the shared secret, and we want to derive some more uh, keys from that, and this part is pretty convoluted. Um, so first off, um, we use the shared secret, which is a point on the elliptic curve, and we just take the x component, and we raise a two by two matrix to that x component. We then use that, the result of that cal calculation, and code it as little endian value, hash it, truncate it, hash it again, and last but not least, we take the resulting digest, split it into two parts, and decrypt both of those parts separately. So yeah, there's a lot going on. Um, in case you're interested, those are the parameters for the matrix. And here's also some code that broadly does that. So you can see it's just doing metric exponentiation, uh, hashing again, copying some bytes around, hashing again, and then encrypting both parts. Um, so next up, we'll take a look at the encryption because it's actually pretty interesting. Um, so you may have already seen that we call it a modified AES algorithm. Um, so to start with that, we'll first take a look at how normal AES is supposed to work. Um, so usually with AES, you have one master key um, that you then derive a certain set of round keys from. Then you take each block, you add the round key to that, and you substitute some bytes around, then you shift some rows, um, rows around in the block, um, you mix some of the columns, Last, uh, then you add a uh, round key again, do that nine times over, and then you have uh, one more round of uh, adding the, uh, you know, substituting some bytes, um, shifting the rows around, and then adding round key once more. Um, so instead of doing all of that, uh, Siemens has decided to 
first off add a step, um, but then also shorten the remaining part to five rounds. Um, so we dubbed the new step the reorder step. Um, yeah, but that's not all. Um, additionally, the round keys are static keys, so usually you have a different master key each time you encrypt, and so the round keys will be different each time. Instead of that, they just use static keys, so technically it's not even an encryption algorithm, because encryption algorithms are supposed to have separate keys, but that's beside the point. Um, but uh, along with that, they also modified the sub-bytes and the mixed column steps. Um, so let's take a look at how that works. Um, so first off, the reorder steps. Uh, this step just um, takes each, uh, no, takes the first and last column, and rotates them by one position. Um, so usually with the mix column step, you take each column, um, take all of the values, apply a mixing function to them that just shuffles them around and does some computation with them and then writes them back to the same location. Um, but instead of that, uh, Siemens has decided to take each column, also apply a function to it, but this function also sort of depends on the round index, on the column index. And then instead of writing it back to um, the same column, they write it back to a row. Um, last but not least, uh, the sub-byte step. Usually you just take each byte in the block and apply a substitution box, which is just a lookup table. For each byte, you have a different byte that it gets substituted for. Um, but instead of that, Siemens has decided to uh, XOR um, a value into both the input and the output of the substitution box, which if you think about it some, just basically is equivalent to using a different substitution box for each round. Okay. Um, so, as a result of those um, encryption, encryptions, we get the, to, uh, the two shared keys. And uh, in the end, we'll use that to actually encrypt the challenge in the symmetric key. And let's take a look at how that works. Um, so, we're not done generating key, the, uh, keys. There's one last key that will be generated, but this one is just generated at random, so that's not that interesting. Um, but we'll uh, protect that key using the two keys we just generated. So the first key from the first half that we uh, generated um, is used to encrypt that new key. Um, that re uh, resulting ciphertext is then hashed and then encrypted using the second key. So this essentially is equivalent to just uh, encryption as well as authentication, um, which is of course the goal um, that wants to yeah, securely and authentically uh, transmit those values. Um, but in the end, now that we have that uh, ephemeral key that has been transmitted securely, we can finally use some sane, sane crypto again. And for that, they decided to use AES GCM, which is pretty well known and well understood and has good properties, um, to finally use that to just uh, concatenate the challenge and symmetric key and encrypt that. Okay, um, so let's take a very quick recap at what we just explored. Um, so the first step, uh, using a symmetric key exchange, Sort of makes sense. I mean, it's not great that the uh, private key is hard coded in the PLC, but yeah, apart from that, using asymmetric key exchanges makes sense. The second stop of deriving shared keys, as far as we can tell, doesn't really serve any cryptographic purposes whatsoever and only exists to make it harder for other people, I mean, well intentioned people as well as bad actors, to create official, um, inofficial clients. As far as we can tell, this doesn't really serve any purpose in terms of cryptography. Um, in the end, the third step is also a bit more convoluted, but it's not as bad, so it's excusable. Um, in the end, all of the values that we um, calculated during all of those steps um, will be transmitted to the PLC in a so-called blob structure, um, which the PLC will then take a look at and uh, recover all the values from. Okay, um, so that is how that handshake works and how we actually uh, securely transmit uh, values to the PLC during a handshake. And with, with all of that, I'll yield back to Colin, who will tell us what we can learn from all of this. So after we have just seen all the details on first decrypting the firmware binary, then analyzing it in Jidra and communicating with the PLC, so basically breaking all of the defenses that Siemens has set up, let's take a step back and look at what do we learn from all this. For that, I had a look at the timeline. So. Stuxnet was in 2010 and it made huge headlines. Siemens was the primarily affected vendor of that first computer war which directly attacked a specific PLC system. Only four years afterwards, we still got only a, an obscured communication protocol from Siemens and this protocol has actually lived until 2022. It only took the revelation from, from 
from Clarity's Team 82 to finally deprecate that legacy communication protocol and replace it with something that uses individual per device certificates that asks you to set up a password and that is based on properly implemented TLS. If this was an operating system or a browser, we probably wouldn't be talking here today. It's one year after the fix, and for browsers and operating systems, in one year, such a fix actually reaches all important machines, at least the majority of it. But still, this isn't the case for PLCs. We still see totally unsecured PLCs every day, and a lot of PLCs which have never seen any firmware update. Why are PLCs so far behind? Which is why I conclude we still have a cultural problem to solve and not a technical one. Let's try to fix that and let's hope it doesn't take us another decade to fix. This is why I want to end our presentation with a call to all affected participants in the industry, starting with the PLC vendors. First of all, despite Siemens' remarkable efforts, please learn that security by obscurity never works out in the long term. The measures that Siemens has taken were really interesting to us as reverse engineers, but after all, none of them have increased the effective security level. An individual password per PLC would have, but not these measures. They have only tried to uh, increase the vendor lock-in. The latest research by Clarity has also shown that uh, with, the, with the traditional protocol, even a password wouldn't have guarded you from being hacked, because this password is also depending on the hard-coded private key, which cannot be changed. The TLS-based firmware could fix all of that, but it has hardly reached existing machines, which is why my next call to PLC vendors is get your update processes fixed. Right now, this is a very tedious manual process. It requires a paid update of the client software running on the workstation. It requires a tedious manual process to go to every PLC around and apply the update. Good luck finding all the PLCs in your company. And for some devices, for example, for the welding machine I originally talked about, this may also imply a costly recertification because that machine was never supposed to run any different software than the one it was delivered with. The next call, therefore, goes out to machine manufacturers. For, first of all, please realize your machine is a computer now, and it needs regular updates, just like every other computer. It is your job to pass them down to your customers, your job is not done just after you have sold the machine. You need to provide continuous service now. To customers, I also want to tell the most important takeaway from today should be keep the company and the machine networks separated. If you already do that, perfect. If you don't do that, I know it can be very compelling to just be able to access a PLC from an office machine in a totally different building, but this is the first step that gets you into security nightmares. So in that case, please restore the separation because, uh, between company and machine networks. Don't expect your PLCs to withstand any serious cyber attacks. Always have another layer of security in your network and know that you're aware of the need for regular updates. Demand them from your machine companies and also from your PLC vendors. And the final call goes out to fellow researchers. Please follow our example, continue to share responsible research, but also reproducible research. We have already shown a few instances where work had to be done over and over again, and this actually only helps the adversaries. There is no point in just doing that over and over again. And for example, as uh, Olly Whitehouse has said this morning in his keynote, we need collaboration and we need radical candor. This just works into that. Sharing here is the only way to advance the state of PLC security. To put it in a nutshell, modern automation products are just embedded computers 
and as such, they need to be subjected to the same cybersecurity standards as the rest of the IT industry. This is the most important takeaway for today. With that, I'd like to conclude our presentation. You can find all of that in even more detail in our white paper. Check it out. We tried to make it accessible to everybody. Shout out to all the people who reviewed our work, and thank you very much for your attention. Do we have any questions? Actually, I think there's a microphone over there if you would. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. Okay, um, one of my companies we're doing actually penetration testing of industrial systems and trains, so I'm quite familiar with this, this, uh, this shit in a nutshell. Uh, just a quick question, did you have a chance to actually work from the PLCs towards the control software? Because from my experience, the control software and the configuration software is vulnerable as hell too. And it's usually run on Windows machine, uh, which is usually sitting inside the network, as you said, in the office somewhere. Um, so you would be talking about the tool used to program those PLCs? Uh, yeah, but also there are tools actually produced by Siemens who actually do operate remotely those PLCs. It's not just a configuration, it's, it's the systems which do collect data about the, for example, frequency of the machine and these things. Yeah, we haven't really taken a look at that. Yeah, I do recommend. It's a okay. really mess. <laughs> I mean, for our goal at our company, our goal was to read out variables. So that's why we wanted to connect to those PLCs. Yeah. yeah so. Actually, four years ago, we were investigating the ransomware attacks on the, uh, on the factories of one of the manufacturers of the PLCs. They were using also Siemens. And the, uh, for the first time, I saw the dead robot factory. Like the dead robots, everything was done. So, yeah, okay. okay. What can definitely be done with a proprietary protocol is not just reading variables, but also writing them or stopping the PLC. So um, even though that doesn't modify the control algorithm that has been programmed on the PLC, I mean, you can change so many variables and this definitely has noticeable impact. And that also works even in the cases where the firmware is signed and certified. So you can still write the values. Because the original Stuxnet was working with the control software, not directly with the PLC. He was working first on the on the control software, and then go when they went for the for the PLC. So that yeah. would require to reprogram the PLC, I guess. Yeah, and yeah, this yeah. is what Stuxnet also did. So I mean, it's okay. one protocol that Siemens currently provides, which does everything that um, the old S7 also did. So you can read variables, write them, but you can also program the PLC. You can basically change everything once you are authenticated. And most of the time you are authenticated without any passwords because that, those are not used. Yep. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, doesn't look like it. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Yep.